Thank you, Veronica. Well, it's great to see you all again. I'm glad to be back here. Some of you will already know who I am. Some of you have been on our IPv6 training courses, and some of you saw me at the security event. But for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm David Holder. I work for Arion. We've been doing IPv6 training and consultancy for almost 20 years, which is a long time in IPv6. And we've dealt with all sorts of organisations, from governments to small enterprises to global enterprises, technology companies, non-technology companies. And with all of these, the big issue that we've had to deal with is how to persuade enterprises to adopt IPv6. So I'm going to tell you how we do this. I'm going to solve the problem for you. <laughs> yeah, OK, so I'm lying. Those of you who know me know this. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was on a plane just a couple of weeks back um, going to the US. And sat next to me was a guy who was the IT director for a global organization. And he asked me why I was going out to the US. So I said I was giving a, an IPv6 keynote presentation to the US federal government. And his first words back to me were, that's not even on my radar. And that's the problem that we have. And this is the way that we view the world, right? We see IPv6 as, as fantastic. We've got wonderful figures showing how it's growing how we can use IPv6 end-to-end, -end, how 100% of transit networks are IPv6. That's the perception that we have of IPv6. But that's not how the enterprise is see it. This is how the enterprises see IPv6. They see we, what we get with IPv4 is the internet. What we get with IPv6 is the internet. But we've had to spend a lot of money and gone through a lot of pain. Now, nobody in their right mind would do this, would they? So there's clearly something wrong here. Um, now, Veronica and a few others, Ed, were at the North American IPv6 Task Force earlier this year, and there John Curran, the president of ARIN, he actually said, this is how it is. And what we need to do is we need to make the IPv6 world looked more attractive. So his suggestion was that we make it more secure. Right? Now, does anybody remember Vista? Windows Vista. A w Who loves Vista? Now, that's interesting, because this happens a lot. I've spoken at conferences, like at Google, where I said, Vista's wonderful. And the reason it's wonderful is because it supports IPv6 and it's got security. And that's why you hated it. Because the security got in everybody's way. So let's imagine, and we're already doing this, by the way, that we add in security to IPv6. What we will wonderfully do is discourage people from adopting IPv6. So, for example, today, the anti-spam best practice for v6 is different from v4. And it means that in v4, legitimate emails will get delivered. They'll get through the anti-spam techniques. But in v6, they might not. Same emails. This is not good. This is how to discourage the enterprise. So that's, that's what they see. But I think John Curran was wrong for two reasons. One is, this isn't reality. And the other is that his solution is the wrong thing to do. This is what I believe is the reality. And it's not about the size of the IPv6 internet. It's about the other bit here. The IPv4 internet. I think the wonderful thing that's going on today that we should all be happy about, and a few people have already alluded to it in a number of talks, is that the IPv4 internet is no longer equivalent to the IPv6 internet. It is a degraded service. It is a second-class service, as Nick said. I think of it as a third-class service. So we need to persuade enterprises with business arguments, not technical arguments, with business arguments that the IPv4 internet is actually a second- or third-class service. Now, sometimes it's easy 
And in the last few weeks, I've talked to a number of our customers where I've had some conversations that go along the way of, that, that, that make me happy because they are conversations that are so easy to justify IPv6. So, for example, um, a very successful business ISP I spoke to the other day, and he was tearing his hair out. He said, David, I can't stand going back to the IPv4 address market and spending good money on addresses. And so they're going to deploy IPv6. We've had clients who've deployed IPv6 because of CGM. We've had other organisations, such as one of the big five accountancy firms, where one of their justifications for moving to IPv6 was that they run out of RFC 1918. We've got another client who have got the iOS 10 problem. And they came to us, and, and they're a game. I don't play games on phones, but apparently they sell a game, and the way they make revenue is by selling add-ons. And it's the add-ons that make them money, and they hit a brick wall where their revenue st stopped on iOS because of the IPv6 only mandate. So sometimes this is dead easy. But what we need to be able to do is to talk not just to the CTOs, like the guy who was sat next to me, but to talk also to the CEOs in language that they understand that makes them want IPv6. So we need to be able to talk about good governance, about web analytics, which they understand today. We need to be able to talk about cyber security, legal intercept, performance, reliability, forensics, all of these things which actually mean something to business organisations. And the good news is we can. And the reason that we can is because the V4 world is getting worse. Now, one of those ways in which it's getting worse, that's already been mentioned, is carrier grade NAT. I love carrier grade NAT. <laughs> and a few people here know how much I love carrier grade NAT. It's a, it is a boon to those of us who want to deploy IPv6 because it deteriorates the IPv4 internet in ways that the end user, the ISP, the content provider and application developers cannot control. So wherever you are in the path, you can be hit your business can be hit by CGN and you have no control over it. And today, we have a global IPv4 internet that is deteriorating because of things like CGN. If you want to know my full views on this, have a look at the talk from North, the North American IPv6 Task Force earlier this year, which is on YouTube. That's not the only thing. There are many other ways in which the IPv4 internet is deteriorating. So don't, even though I've got another slide on CGN, CGN is not the only way that things are going badly with IPv4. Uh, for example, many of you will know that we're getting increasing fragmentation in the address space, which is affecting lots of things like geolocation and routing efficiency. We're getting problems with the fact that we're out of address space. When cyber attacks occur, and they used to use unused IPv4 address space, today they, use, they squat, and they might be using your address space. So there are these things as well. But CGN is wonderful because it has an impact on things that mean something to businesses. So, for example, this is a great example. If Eric was still here, he would be with me because he lives in Belgium. And Belgium, he said, was it 50% now? 50% of IPv6 penetration. Does anybody know why? Legal intercept. legal intercept, exactly right. And the legal intercept problem they were worried about was the one up here. CGN compresses the users and their usage of IPv4 addresses so that you end up with more and more users using the same IP address. And they were worried that this would make forensics and legal intercept impossible. In the old days, one IP meant one user. It was trivial. Then we moved to the NAT44. Still relatively trivial. But with CGN, it becomes significantly non-trivial. Because in order to know 
which end user, not only do you need to record the time, the IP and the port numbers accurately, but the ISP has to record the internal and external ports and IP addresses for every single session. And each of you has tens of thousands of sessions, maybe 30, 40,000 sessions in your home per day. And if you're a small ISP with a million subscribers, that quickly becomes pentabytes per year, which is unrealistic. And so the Belgian government said, we will set a limit on the CGN compression ratio. Does anybody know what it is? 16, 16 to 1. And that is one of the motivations that pushed the ISPs there to deploy IPv6. Has anybody heard of the latest announcement about CGN from Europol? No. Yes, a few. I thought you might have done. A couple of weeks ago, Europe, Europol announced that what they were looking to do was to mandate, what they'd like to do, is to mandate across Europe the banning of CGN. Good yeah, good luck with that. That's where I thought, Adrian. <laughs> My initial reaction was, that ain't going to work. But... It shows how seriously they are taking the national security and the law enforcement implications. And of course, this isn't a business thing, this is a governmental thing. But from a business perspective, you have responsibilities for legal intercept. You have responsibilities for good governance. And that involves logging, it involves analytics, it involves being able to trace back to the source address. So this is um, an issue for you. So the solution is to tell people not how wonderful IPv6 is, although sometimes, as I said, that works. But the real story that we need to be getting across there is the IPv4 internet is getting significantly worse. And I would love, and in fact, I asked for this a few years back, and Mark will remember this, uh, where we suggested that the UK government should actually state uh, trading standards was our angle, I think, that services provided through CGN should not be marked as broadband ser ser services. Because right? not a true internet service. Uh, we didn't succeed. Uh, that was actually like a lot of things. But anyway, going back to my earlier thing about perception, I just want to go back to our perception again. Because what we've been looking at today is fantastic news for IPv6. We've been seeing how well it's deployed and how it's grown in the UK. But we are looking at it from the viewpoint of technologists. Yeah? So looking through our eyes, we are seeing it from technologists. So when we measure um, those figures, and we get 50% for Belgium, we get... Um, 26 for the UK, thank you. That's a measure of 50, right? Only 50. It's a sample of 50 sites from the Alexia top websites that are in the UK. Hey, guys, this is skewed to technology companies. Yeah? Right? It's a good statistic because it shows the websites that get the most traffic, right? They're important. It's a really important statistic. But there are other important measures for organizations other than how many people go to their websites. Really, um, Arion would be very upset if that was the only measure of our company. Um, <laughs> because we're not a YouTube or a Google or, a Google or a Facebook. Or... So I've got some statistics for you. Down the years, we've been taking statistics, which we rarely publish. But here we are. This is the FTSE 100. So this is a different way of looking at important enterprises, right? And if you look at the FTSE 100, 3% of their websites are IPv6 enabled. If you look at the UK government, and this is about going on for 3,000 sites, 3%. I can see you're thinking they're all the same pie chart, aren't you? I saved a bit. They're not. They're all different. Right, the sample size here, does anybody want to, get, oh, the, the clue's in the name. It's 100, right? <laughs> the sample size here is 3,000. And I, th they are different. And UK schools, right, almost 12,000 there, but still 
3%. So when you look at it, not from a technologist, technologist world, but from the perspective of different environments such as government or enterprise, then the stats are not as good as maybe we would like them to be. So, that's my view, and we can then discuss it and talk about what you think. Uh, first of all, I think the perception in enterprises, so everyone that we talk to, is that there's no benefit from IPv6. But the reality is that the IPv4 internet is deteriorating, and the message that we can give to people can be translated into business into business wording, which is good for uh, justifying of IPv6. Actually, my life's quite easy, because most of the customers that come to us want V6. And uh, so part of the job's already done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, <clears throat> Ronick and I suggest we maybe have... 15 minutes discussion and finish at 5.30 and then distill to the pattern Noster, I think Pater it is, for any further discussion on V6 only or extension headers or um, beer, whatever. <laughs> so, questions? There must be some for David. Or suggestions? Or um, There was this perception in the industry that uh, IoT was going to be one of the huge big cases for, or for IPv6 deployment. What is actually happening in reality in regards to IoT deployment? Well, if you noticed on my slide of people where it's easy, we do have customers that are going for IPv6 because of IoT. So it is, it is reality. Um, IoT is pushing IPv6. And if you look at the standards out there, historically, the biggest player was Zigbee. Right? They're, they're the biggest for IoT, which was not an IPv6 technology. It was a, a priority, if you like, layer 3 technology for constrained devices. Uh, Zigbee IP has been released now. Does anybody know what it's based on? Three years ago? Sorry? Six low pound. <coughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest player has gone, whoa! You know, we, we, we need to move to IPv6. That's the biggest player in the world. There's a lot of noise from the little ones that doesn't matter. But if you look at Google's thread and weave, what's that based on? V6, six low pan, again. So the big players are V6 already. And there are a lot of little players. For example, in the UK, a big player in the UK is Hive. Does anybody know what Hive's based on? Zigbee. And the inventor of Hive said to me when I met him, he said, if, he sold the company now, but <laughs> he said, if I did it again, it would be IPv6. So I think in answer to your question, we're getting customers coming to us because, to deploy IPv6 because of IoT. And I think the standards shifting to IPv6 is an indication of where the industry overall is going. And my message to anybody who's doing IoT is if you're not using 6 low pan, you are making a mistake now. Hi. Um, I don't suppose you have any idea how many IP6-only websites there are. Uh, no. <laughs> Does anybody? Well, that would be an interesting stat to find out. There I've, are actually some amongst... My stats have gone. Yeah. But in actual fact, amongst the 3% on the schools and on ac.uk, which we also measured, which was 4%. Some of those are IPv6 only, are they? Some of those are IPv6 only. But, I mean, come on, it's only 4%. Um, I just didn't put it up. Yeah. yeah but I didn't tally those. I, I, I sort of heard a rumour that it was more common in China, for example. where there We were, haven't uh, measured China. Knows. But others have. Um, it's a pity Eric's gone. He might I will actually also add to that the question. So Jan Zors from uh, in, uh, from Slovenia, and oh, he's Slovenia, in ISOC, yes. and then Sander Stefan is from Netherlands. They actually put together a website where there is a list of pages that work as IPv6 only and through NAT64. Uh, we can post that information in the LinkedIn group. I think the announcement was a few months ago about it. So they've got some list. It's quite interesting. 
There was a question. E, yes, so one additional reason that you didn't have on this on your slides, but I'm sure you know it, um, to like CGN from the IPv6 perspective is geolocation. Yep. Um, because of the potential for the deterioration in the granularity that uh, yep. providers can get in the, uh, from the data packs, which is a big legitimate risk from the, for advertisers and for legal considerations in certain jurisdictions. Yeah. Maybe not so much in the UK, but in other countries, yeah, it's definitely a thing. Yeah, That's we had that from the BBC. This is good on the yeah. geolocation side but it's a legitimate risk that they're looking at in the V4 side as well. It is encouraging deployment, and I have, I have used that as a, as a lever yeah. to help. So, so have I. You're absolutely right. And we actually have clients who've gone for V6 for exactly that reason, because of the geolocation uh, issues. So it's, it's interesting. I was, when I was listening to the BBC talk, their focus was on the problems, uh, whereas the IPv6 solves some of them. Yeah. Hi, Mark. David. <laughs> um, I need to be devil's advocate here on, uh, on the CGN thing. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear how much you love it. Um, on the other hand, one of the arguments that you use sometimes, and I've heard other people's use, is that for leg legitimate law enforcement purposes, the logging that would be required to actually capture um, CGN-based information about identity would be so great that it, it would put some small ISPs out of business. And on a report that you helped co-author, I remember an interview with a major mobile provider here in the United Kingdom yep. who off the record simply indicated that they were not going to do it. They would never comply with the requirements for logging and they would continue to use CGNs for as long as the technology lived. And so what, and, and they were willing to take, and in fact, I'm not aware of any public prosecution that has taken place anywhere in Europe where an ISP was called into court because they didn't have those logs. Mm. Uh, and I've actually, in the last six months, had a reason to research that. Um, not that I was ever charged. <laughs> <laughs> I did answer questions, but I was never charged. And so I think that one of the things that we see in practice is, is exactly your argument that we think about this as technologists and not as business people. The business people do the cost benefit analysis and say, we're simply not going to do those logs. And if someone comes to us, we, we have lawyers and we'll just deal with it that way. And so I've, I've had major providers, both mobile providers and also broadband providers say to me, again, off the record, and again, they've not been charged either, but that 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 argument doesn't hold any water for them. And I wondered what you'd say about that. And I kind of think I know. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the question, actually, Mark. I was so interested in what you were saying and the examples you were giving, I got carried away. Does that argument hold any water anymore? Um, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. Uh, which argument? <laughs> the argument that the, the legitimate law enforcement requirements for logging oh, right. are, yeah. are so extreme spend an enormous amount of money uh, on stock options for disc companies, or on the other hand, simply leave the business. I just yeah. wanted to yeah, follow the up on that. The arguments, sorry? sorry I was the just going to say a follow up on that. It's worth bearing in mind that it, the um, uh, sort of legal perspective in Europe is very much in favour of not blanket recording yep, information. Yeah, that's like exactly this. what I was going to say. This, yep. this is quite important that it's meant to be targeted. Now, a, a CGN, where you've got an order to monitor a particular person, is, of course, much simpler logging requirements than having blanket recording. And, and there's moves away from blanket recording, so we shouldn't, in theory... Yeah. Need to Adrian's absolutely it. right. It's actually a, a complicated thing, because in some jurisdictions, it's even illegal to record the amount of data you get from a CGN, because you're actually doing deep packet inspection. Um, and so you have a conflict between what you can legally do on, on one side and what, uh-oh, you're legally obliged to do on the other side. Uh, and you, you take your pick. Which do you go for? Yeah. I think Adrian's argument is exactly right. I 100% agree with him. But on the other hand, that invalidates the argument yeah. that you need these enormous amounts of business rights yeah. uh, in order to block. And that's, and that's why I bring up the question about CGNs, is that that's, while I love CGNs just as much as you do for the deterioration of the quality of the IPv4 network. I think talking about the legitimate law enforcement requirements doesn't help further the argument anymore. Okay. It's, not just, it's not just um, service providers, is it? It's, it's, 
it's, it's the yeah, it's the other end as well. So you ha Nick's absolutely right. So to actually trace someone back, so say an incident occurs, you as the person being attacked through that CGM have to have the data that uh, to a level of accuracy that in the past you wouldn't have needed to do as well. So it is it's actually coupled. There's two different things there. You've got you've got lawful intercept, which is the real time intercepting of the traffic, which would require a warrant, and it is on a person basis, not an IP. You don't get a warrant for an IP; you get a warrant for a person. Yeah. Um, versus the compliance stuff, which is the logging, which you were talking about. So the two different problems yeah. there. Um, with the carry grade net and the logging argument, again, that's vendor dependent. So you're not going to get a lot of carry grade net implementations out there that require you to log on a per flow basis. You're going to get radius accounting start messages for a block of pools. And that block of pool, uh, that pool of ports is that one sub internal subscriber. So you just have one radius accounting uh, session to, to monitor for that customer, not flow. Only, only if your ISP yeah. has configured your CGN to do it that way. Yes, okay. so they don't have to do proactively, they only have to do retroactively. Exactly. Yes. And so that is true, but then we get into the whole argument about all the knobs that you can twist within CGN. And a responsible person like yourself, of course, would configure the CGN in a way that that was possible. But an irresponsible person like Ian, oh, Ian, for example. <laughs> I'm just going to jump the queue very quickly. Anyone that actually build something that isn't doing it along the way that Richard describes as a, an ISP has made a stupidly poor uh, design or vendor decision up front regardless of anything else because you just put your cost and volumes and risk up for no other benefit. Yeah. Well, you get a tiny benefit from extra compression. So um, our experience of talking to people in a um, language that CEOs tend to understand. Um, so we're currently dealing with one potential customer. They got quite a lot of IP address space on a half rack. Um, their contract's just come up for renewal and their data center provider have uh, taken all of the addresses back and said you can have 16 instead of 500 because you're not paying enough compared to the other people in our data center. If you don't like it, get out. Um, so um, their current options are hope we buy them or go bust. Um, so um, existential risk is one that the CEOs might like. Um, and the other one we've just had um, is one of our customers. We did a, a big VM container rollout. They've got thousands, of, thousands and thousands of things each on their own um, IPv6 address. Uh, they have a centralized SMTP service that's v4 only. Somebody somewhere in one of their containers has gone and put an invalid username and password in. So every time someone uses it too many times, it blacklists their gateway address and shuts all email sending from their entire system down. Um, so when they came to us and said, can you fix it? Our answer was, sure, tell us the v6 address of the container and we'll go fix the config for you. Um, they said, well, we don't have v6, it's the central v4 address of the whole lot. So the reply to that is, here's a consultancy fee to audit your entire estate and find out where you've put the wrong value in, have a bill. Um, and if there's one thing finance people don't like, it's unexpected bills. And that follows on from the previous thing I've done in the previous presentation, which is if you itemize out v4 costs, um, two things happen. Firstly, accountants come to you and ask you, what is v4 and why am I paying for it? And secondly, technical people, at the risk of having to explain to the accounting department why they need to spend more money than they might otherwise have to, will voluntarily start implementing V6 because <laughs> they hate accountants more than they hate V6. <laughs>